Today's topic, plus a bonus topic, but today's topic is ETH as an investable asset. Here to discuss are Lynn Alden, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, and Raul Pal, founder and CEO of Global Macro Investor and Real Vision Group. Welcome, Lynn and Raul. Great to be here. Hey, thanks for having me. Both of you are widely respected for your financial an analysis and views, and you're also both known for being big believers in Bitcoin. And yet you two have opposite views on the value of Ether, which is the asset native to the Ethereum network. Well, in January, you tweeted, ETH equals BTC, like it or not. What do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? You know, again, I, I'm a macro guy, so I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't have the engineering background that Lynn has, but how I approach this is I look at the attributes of how it trades as an asset. And what I did is I looked at estimations of network effects and said, well, do they look similar? And when you plot out Bitcoin's journey, its market cap or its price versus the number of active wallets, Actually, there's a nice clear regression line. Um, and it happens after a certain period of time. So it gets to about 5 million wallets. And then it goes in a very clear, steep line, which is essentially an estimation of Metcalfe's law. And I found that Ethereum was exactly mirroring Bitcoin. When I say exactly, when I look at it on a plot graph with the same regression, it looks similar. But because it started later, it just follows Bitcoin earlier. But in fact, its adoption, i.e. the number of wallets at this time, is actually a faster rate of adoption than Bitcoin had. But what's super interesting is when you go back and match them from 1 million active wallet addresses each, their prices are identical and their price movements have been identical. And that took me by surprise. I didn't expect to see that because that normally doesn't happen. You have to fit the graphs. But it perfectly fit in every way. It's exactly currently in the 2017 run up that Bitcoin had. And at exactly the same time after it hit a million wallets, it gives you something similar. So that's when I say ETH equals Bitcoin is because when you think of it in macro terms, they're both really network effects. And so they may have very different properties. There may be different things entirely, and people struggle with value when it comes to network effects. They, almost everybody underestimates value by definition because we try and anchor it on something that we perceive as value. But network effects are so hard to think in because they're exponential. Hmm. Yeah, this is really interesting. And you're right when I think to the uh, kind of like late 2013, early 2014 run up in Bitcoin, I think it peaked at about... 1250 and then ETH in the last cycle peaked at about 14 something 20 or, or roughly so just 200 or less than $200 and, difference. And they both had 90% pullbacks. Everybody said they were dead. They were worthless. Bitcoin got down to about 100 and started rallying. ETH got down to 100 started I mean, it's literally identical. <laughs> and it's, that's weird. That's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I, I mean, it was compelling. I mean, the one thing that I do have to ask you, which, uh, you know, I um, didn't prepare early enough to send you an email, but I just was trying to figure out, did the metrics about the wallets come from blockchain.com? Because when I was looking at the blockchain.com wallet numbers, I couldn't really match them against your slides. And then I was wondering, like, anyway, but did it come from blockchain.com? I'm not or? sure. Remy, my uh, analyst who puts together oh, okay. the data, got it from I'm not sure what sources, but I don't think it was blockchain.com. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So yeah, maybe I can send an email and then we can put a link or something in the show notes. Okay. So Lynn, you have a totally different conclusion after writing like an extremely well-researched piece on all the ins and outs of Ethereum. So based on that extensive research, you concluded that you would not invest in Ethereum at this time. So what factors led you to that decision? Yeah. So one thing I'd point out is I don't really view my my position is opposite of Rao. I actually think there's a ton of overlap. Um, it's just not a perfect overlap. And the, you know, the way I kind of look at it is, so for example, in the article, uh, the overall conclusion is that I, I could see a non-zero allocation to Ethereum as making sense. And so for, I, I gave, for example, 80% Bitcoin, 20% Ethereum, or 90% Bitcoin, 10% Ethereum, or 100 to zero. I think there's still a case uh, to kind of you know, focus on Bitcoin, which is what I'm, I'm preferring to do. Uh, but I also point out that you know if Ethereum were to break over 1400, which now as as of this recording it has, 
that's pretty bullish for the price action during a during a bull market in a broad sense. And so it's not necessarily that I'm bearish on the price in, in any kind of given six or 12 month period. It's more about outlining various pros and cons and then kind of sharing some of the concerns I had. And so uh, I do agree that it is the, the, you know, really the one other protocol that does have a substantial network effect. Uh, and so that that's pretty much undisputable because so many tokens run on Ethereum now. There's so much development happening on Ethereum. And I so in my kind of mind, I think the, the big concern is to make sure we, in some ways, we separate uh, the growth of the ecosystem from the growth of price in the long term. Uh, and because you can be, for example, very bullish on the the amount of value that's settled on Ethereum, the amount of uh, smart contracts that happen on Ethereum, uh, and then have a somewhat different view on what happens to actual Ethereum token appreciation over the long run when you include bullish and bearish cycles. Uh, mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, for example, if you look back during the 2017 high, uh, since then, uh, about three times as much value settles on Ethereum, and the market cap is still just roughly back to where it was. Uh, and you know, that for, for an Ethereum bull, uh, what you then argue is that therefore Ethereum is undervalued, and therefore that's kind of a bull case for Ethereum. A somewhat different view is, you know, for people that aren't familiar, uh, John Pfeffer wrote a paper back uh, in late 2017, uh, you know, kind of highlighting this problem. And he basically, his argument was that the utility protocols, even if they are used for a lot of, uh, you know, kind of ecosystem GDP, you could call it, if they're, if they're used for a variety of things, that the value won't necessarily accrue to those tokens. Basically, you can have a high velocity and that, you know, uh, mm-hmm. there basically might not be kind of a quote unquote moneyness associated with those tokens in the long term. It doesn't preclude those from from being moneyness. If we see things like uh, you know more and more collateralization of Ethereum, if we see you know a, a strong preference towards staking and kind of enough people wanted to to hodl it as money, uh, it, it can still become money. Uh, but basically, there, there's somewhat of a separate argument about the size of the the ecosystem and this and the price of the tokens in the long run. Although I do agree, uh, I think in many points that it you know I can see why a lot of people want to have a position in Ethereum. And I can also see that it, it does so far have a substantial network effect. Uh, and I think one of the challenges going forward is how Ethereum is going to transition because Bitcoin is, you know, for the most part, a finished product. It's still it's still evolving just like any other finished product. Like they're still making updates to Adobe Photoshop, for example. <laughs> but it's in but it's in like and the Microsoft release. Word. Exactly. But they're released things. Whereas Ethereum, because they're still doing radical changes to the underlying protocol and they're, you know, as they shift from Ethereum one, Ethereum two, they go from proof of work to proof of stake. They're changing some of the some of the dynamics because they're running into the scaling problems. Basically, there's just a lot more implementation risk, I think. And so you're, you're kind of getting a higher higher risk uh, investment. And you know, I'm kind of open about whether or not it's higher reward. And that's why my preference was I can see why people like it, but that my view is I, I still like the risk reward of Bitcoin the best. And you know, to be fair, Lynn and I would probably have roughly similar similar allocations. For the same reason, you know, when we look at asset allocation terms, there's three main metrics we use. One is liquidity preference. So Bitcoin has liquidity preference. So it's our base in this bet in the in the digital asset space. The next is time preference. Well, Bitcoin has been around longer. It also has a more understandable um, both network effect and value proposition. So you tend to hold it longer. But risk preference. And Ethereum has both of those, but not quite as superior as Bitcoin. Risk preference, there is a, um, a because it's earlier and its network affects the chances of more exponential price rises are, are higher. So you need a smaller allocation to have roughly similar effects in the portfolio. So we kind of agree. The one thing I did, I did want to mention was that John Pfeffer paper. I kind of wrote a, a long article about it. Both of those things, firstly, he kind of said that the network effect didn't apply to anything except Bitcoin, which I, I think has been proven wrong. But the other one is he used the quantity theory of money, which basically we threw out in about 1981. Um, and I worry that trying to look at these in terms of moneyness is trying to compare Bitcoin with an apple. That they're, <laughs> they're kind of not the same thing. I, I and cannot... Raul, can you explain what the quantity theory of money is? Well, this is this MV equals PQ um, way of... Of looking at, and that's why we talk about velocity of money because that right. was one of the reasons the whole thing fell apart. And and you know you're trying to figure out what the overall value of the money proposition is within this. And I'm not sure any of that applies. And that that was my issue with John Pepper's paper. I thought it was really interesting, but I spent a long time thinking about. It. I thought, a that doesn't work in the real world. I mean, there is literally zero correlation between uh, money supply and inflation. 
So that kind of throws all of his arguments, all of that kind of Friedman stuff out of the window. So I looked at it and thought, well, what is the difference here? I think he's arguing the case for Bitcoin about Bitcoin as a reserve asset and then saying, basically, nothing else looks like that. And guess what? Nothing else looks like Bitcoin. And that's why we love Bitcoin. You know, it has a unique value proposition in the world. And many of these other protocols have their own unique value propositions. Many of them will not get network effect. And some that we don't even know of now will have massive network effects. It's the same happened with the internet, same happened with mobile phone networks and almost any other network that we've seen. Do hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel.